Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. We're into part two of the day, or the morning. And I think it was Mark Twain that was credited with saying that there's nothing more certain in life than death and taxes. But when you come to death, I'm reminded about a comment made by a mediator, don't ever stand between a beneficiary and the money. <laughs> it can get ugly. And it certainly can get ugly when the beneficiary or a prior beneficiary may have some element of undue influence exercised against a will maker. We've already had Eleanor touch on that and Andrew's going to give us some outline of hotspots in relation to the vulnerable. Andrew Verse Van Dog. Thanks Richard and uh, good morning everyone. You'll see that I headed my paper Hot Spots in Willmaking for the Vulnerable. I was thinking about calling it a select judicial hit list, but uh, I didn't want the words hit list, judicial and verse bandonk to come up on a Google search. So <laughs> I, I went with what I've got there, though when you think about it, rundown's probably not much of an improvement, is it? Uh, the point of this paper is to show where some practitioners have been praised and some practitioners have been criticised for their conduct in making wills for the vulnerable. Now, when I talk about vulnerable will makers, I don't just mean the elderly, though obviously the elderly are in the, the prime uh, spot to actually qualify uh, for that epithet. You will see the uh, statistics I quote in paragraph one, um, some form of dementia found in one in 20 people over the age of 65, one in five over the age of 80. Now, dementia does not equate to a lack of testamentary capacity. However, it is clearly going to be a factor which is going to make someone extremely vulnerable and may well mean that they do lack capacity. Moreover, dementia, the inability to um, make judgments and uh, basically have the energy to stand up for oneself anymore, can also predispose people to the exercise of influence, which might in fact be undue influence. So the bad news for um, solicitors seems to be this. This is an issue for our times as the population ages and uh, you are the ones when you're making wills for people who need to be the gatekeepers, the watchdogs and uh, ensure that uh, the job is not only done thoroughly and documented thoroughly, but for the purposes of this paper in particular, um, done to the satisfaction of a Supreme Court judge who has had the opportunity of reading uh, everything with 2020 hindsight, hearing from uh, many other witnesses uh, than perhaps will be available to you when you do wills and powers of attorney for such people, and has the opportunity to sit in court over a number of days and hear um, erudite submissions about why you ought to have done something different. Now, you really have my sympathy. I couldn't make that work commercially. Um, that's why I came to the bar. Uh, but that's where you are. And how you manage that is going to um, take judgment and uh, a number of um, decisions about what you charge for wills, I think. And uh, moreover, when you act for people in making wills and powers of attorney. So we move on to the first um, heading I've got there on page two. Starting at the very beginning, it seems to me that uh, there is an issue which has been raised by at least two judges in New South Wales about whether or not you ought to be acting at all for someone in making a will. And that situation arises where you have uh, an existing client who comes along to you and says, um, I want you to make a will for X and uh, I'm going to be a beneficiary of that will. Now when it's put so boldly, it, it, it seems obvious, but um, you would be surprised at the amount of times that uh, this situation arises. And uh, at the beginning of last year, in Dickman and Holly, we saw such an instance of this. 
The impugned wills, there were two of them, I won't bore you with the details as to why, they were made a very short space of time um, between each other, basically left the elderly testatrix's estate to the Salvation Army. She was living in a Salvation Army care home. The solicitor who actually made the will was contacted by the care home and the reason well, perhaps it wasn't the reason he was contacted, but he was certainly well known to the care home because his office was in Salvation Army premises and he acted for the Salvation Army. Now, there were a number of criticisms of his conduct which were made and we'll touch on a couple of others of them, but the thing that struck me is that um, the warnings of Justice Santow in a case called Pates and Craig, which I've uh, referred to at paragraph four of my paper on page two, which you all ought to read, um, hadn't been heeded by this particular solicitor. And this is what the judge in Dickman and Holly had to say. Although Mr Hopper did not perceive that he had a conflict of interest, or more accurately, a conflict, conflict between duty and duty, I think he did have such a conflict. The Property Trust was an established client. He worked from its offices. The Salvation Army Property Trust would expect him to do what was proper to document what Mr Hopper was told was Mrs Simpson's intention to leave her estate to the Salvation Army. His duty to Mrs Simpson included making inquiries relevant to her testamentary capacity, including as to whether she appreciated who had claims on her bounty and was able to evaluate those claims. This would have included inquiring who was or were the beneficiary or beneficiaries of any existing will, bringing Mrs Simpson's mind to bear on the question of who, other than the Salvation Army, might have claims on her estate was potentially not in the interests of his established client, the Salvation Army. You see the logic. Now, it's difficult in this kind of situation uh, sometimes because you might have you might act for a family uh, you might act for a son and the son says can you do a will for my mum and of course you know that the son's going to be included along with siblings perhaps those are difficult situations to negotiate you're going to have to make up your own minds about whether or not um, the circumstances will permit you to do it safely but a situation such as this one in Dickman and Holly it, it, could, it shouldn't have been all that hard Mr Hopper obviously had uh, a practice beyond uh, the will maker's will file, he should have just said, look, I'm, I act for the Salvation Army, you want to leave everything to the Salvation Army, you're quite old, and there were a number of other concerning aspects of the case as well, how about you go and see someone else? So sometimes it will be difficult making that call, but sometimes it will be easy. When it's easy, just make the call. That would be my advice on that. The issue wasn't directly raised as a conflict issue in Brown and Gus, but it, it did raise its head. The final will, which was the will that was upheld, was um, prepared by the firm which acted for the major beneficiary's son. There, there are a couple of different grandchildren involved in Brown and Gus. Um, the Gus grandchildren were the ones who were criticised. The Brown grandchildren were not criticised. But um, the firm which did the will actually had the grandson of the ultimate beneficiary as a client, and he was a property developer, quite a successful one. So he was a significant client to the firm, I would have thought. Uh, he and his father engaged that firm to prepare the will. And uh, Justice McMillan quite properly said, well, um, it's been alleged then that uh, these are suspicious circumstances which required me to be satisfied that uh, the testatrix knew and approved the will. And the relevant suspicion, of course, was if the grandson and the son got this firm to do the will for the mother, then the suspicion would be that uh, the firm was just acting as their agent, or the instrument, I, I think Her Honour described it. That was the suspicion. Justice Macmillan considered, however, that um, she could be so satisfied that the deceased knew and approved the contents of the will because she received independent advice. And the independent advice that Her Honour relied on was uh, the 
job done by Anna McKenna, who was the law clerk who prepared the last will, which was upheld. I've left Anna's name in this paper because um, she did such a good job and she was given a pat on the back by Justice McMillan. You will see throughout the paper where other Victorian practitioners uh, are in issue. I, I've deleted their names. They're on the judgments, um, so everyone will know who they are. But uh, it just seemed to me that I'd, I'd, <laughs> I, I'd, I'd take the, the charitable course. But um, Anna did a great job, and Justice McMillan uh, clearly sets that out in the extract on pages four and five of the paper. It seems to me that because Anna McKenna did such a good job, the issue never loomed larger in her honour's mind. Um, it may be that uh, the issue of conflict could have been um, further pressed. I don't know how far it was pressed, perhaps it was, but the conclusion I drew uh, from that case, because it seems to me on the face of it, there is at least a potential to make an argument about a conflict of duties there. Um, Anna McKenna's conduct basically solved the problem or any such, to the, to the extent that it was a problem that the firm had. Now, the second hotspot I've got on starting on page five is documentation. And it seems funny in a way to deal with it up front. In my past pitfall papers, I've talked about documentation, but I've always left it till the end. You know, you've got to do this, 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 and this, and then you've got to document it. But the more I think about it, the more I do these cases, the more I think that documentation is really of such crucial importance that it has to be taken from the end and stuck right up the front. Bear in mind that unless you're facing an allegation of undue influence, which the challenger has to prove, all validity issues are uh, to be proved by the propounder of the will that you have drawn. You can only do that if there's evidence admissible to a court to prove them. You will not be able to remember the will transactions in sufficient detail to satisfy a judge. So, the file that you have is going to assume an absolutely enormous importance. You've got to do a good job, as you all will. You've got to document the good job. And you have to retain the documentation. Now, the last one seems so obvious as to um, that I, sh I shouldn't even bother to have said it. But um, as we will see, um, sometimes uh, that isn't done. Over the page, Nicholson and Nags, Justice Vickery was uh, very complimentary about the penultimate will solicitor's documentation. He did a good job, that man. He took good detailed notes of everything. He asked questions as to reasons about gifts and he wrote down Betty Dyke's own answers verbatim. That is very important. Making a will for a vulnerable test data, I would think would be a fairly miserable experience. You have to be very much on your guard and you have to ask all the right questions and you have to write and write and write and write and make sure your notes are absolutely clear and unambiguous about who was there and who said what, as we'll see. The contrast that Justice Vickery drew, though, was um, between the way the penultimate solicitor, if I can call him that, did that will and the last solicitor did that will. Her notes were sparse, and uh, they amounted to about four typed lines each. She'd actually made handwritten notes at the, the attendance, then she'd thrown them away when she prepared a typewritten note. Uh, that's not a great idea. Uh, there was also an issue about who was actually present at the time, because she marked her um, note, attendance upon Betty Dyke and one of the beneficiaries. Whereas, in fact, she gave evidence later that um, the other beneficiary had just driven Betty Dyke there. So the fact that she'd walked in the door got her a spot on the file note as being attended upon. Now, obviously, that's not something you want. It's, it's not accurate for a start. And uh, clearly, in, um, in trying to propound that last will, that gave us um, a bit of trouble. And Justice Vickery was quite scathing. He said that um, these were plainly in an, in an inadequate record and, in fact, barely met the description of a record. Uh, you will see at paragraph 10, too, that that had implications for knowledge and approval because there was a conflict of evidence um, about the practice of the firm. So even though, even though the two witnesses for the last will said it was read and explained to her, a previous codicil 
the witness to that had said, oh, well, that was always the practice of the firm to actually let the test date or read it themselves. So Justice Vickery said, conflict in evidence, the note's inadequate, can't be satisfied. You see the point. Petrovsky and Nasev is uh, a, uh, yeah, a, um, a real warning. I won't go through the facts of that, save to say you had a very elderly widow who was, uh, whose English was as a second language. The file notes in that were sparse, where they existed at all. Um, the solicitor also acted for the beneficiary, I might say. The uh, solicitor noted that the deceased had confirmed her telephone instructions, but later in cross-examination conceded there hadn't been any telephone conversation with her. But interestingly, even though there was such a thin and threadbare file, the solicitor did a wonderful affidavit. Yeah. We can laugh. <laughs> Too good to be true. That's right. Um, Justice Hallen, Associate Justice Hallen, said that effectively that was the product of an unconscious reconstruction. Now, we don't want that said about any of us. Keep a full record. In Veal, uh, just getting back to retaining the written record, at paragraph 12 on page 8, the uh, fellow who made the will was convinced in the 20 minutes he spent with uh, Mr Veal at the cafe, at the Toc H I think, that he uh, totally had his marbles and had no doubt at all about his capacity. He didn't open a file. He told the judge he presumed he'd made a note of Keith Veal's instructions. He threw the note into the rubbish bin after the will was made. Now, don't do that at home, please. Don't try that at home. The judge made the obvious point that he hadn't been asked to give a written record of his uh, activities that day until two and a half years after the event. So what sort of um, leverage was his evidence really going to have at the end of the day? Brown and Gus on page 9 at paragraph 13. The penultimate will which favoured the family of a predeceased daughter was allegedly made on the basis of an agreement the old lady had had with her predeceased daughter when she was dying about looking after her family even though she was going to die. That had occurred apparently in 2005. Subsequent will in 2007 hadn't put it into effect at all. The instructions for the penultimate will were taken in the presence of the grandson of the predeceased daughter, and there was a note about this agreement. Look at page 10. The solicitor's file note of the meeting records the deceased instructions were that she and Sandra basically entered into the agreement. Cross examination comes along. The solicitor initially said he thought he was told this by the deceased. But in cross-examination and in re-examination admitted this was also said by the grandson. So what have you got? You've got an inaccurate note. It's inaccurate as to the source of this crucial instruction about the alleged agreement. That's going to shake the confidence of any judge, it would seem to me. And think about that. That's going to come out in cross-examination. Moments of high drama. Everyone's listening. Everyone is completely focused. And all of a sudden, the instructions are no longer just coming from the deceased, as they should have, but also the grandson whose interests they serve. Now, that is not going to be missed by a judge, and in fact it wasn't. So the accuracy of the note underscored, if you like, the unreliability of the uh, solicitor who prepared that will. Paragraph 16 is just another little wrap for Anna McKenna that uh, Justice McMillan gave her, and I'll leave you to uh, read that at your leisure. Next, page 11. Take direct instructions. Don't take instructions through an intermediary. Um, the cases have been clear about this for a long time, and uh, the New South Welsh case of uh, Sharman uh, is extracted for you. The will uh, was produced on the instructions of a daughter. I don't think the solicitor actually ever saw the deceased. And you'll see at the extract at paragraph 21 on page 11, that's the extract from the case, paragraph 21, the court always looks with great suspicion on a will that's prepared by a solicitor without direct contact, obviously. But um, going over the page to paragraph 22, it also talks about seeing the testator without the presence of any beneficiaries. 
and the judge recognises that this is difficult, though often this will be impossible for psychological or other reasons, but when this is not done, there will almost always be problems with showing the will was made with the knowledge and approval of a free and capable testator. Ask people to leave. Tell them that justice must not only be done, but must be seen to be done. It's silly. We know there's no problem, but um, we just have to make sure that everything is fine, just in case someone says that something went wrong later. We can prove that it's all fine. That's the way I used to handle it when I was in practice. And I'm sure you handle it um, somewhat, um, you know, in some similar fashion, but, but insist, insist. Brown and Gus, again, the grandson uh, was giving instructions or it was certainly present for the two hours that the old lady was giving instructions for her penultimate will with this particular solicitor. He clarified certain matters, which is a rather Orwellian uh, word, it seems to me. And he also helpfully made comments on the needs of his family members and said, oh, look, you know, if, if, if Marilla's mortgage of $500,000 is paid off, Simon, my uncle, he'll still get $2.8 million. Uh, that wasn't the kind of input which was going to give the judge any confidence as to the uh, integrity of those instructions. And Justice McMillan, uh, you'll see it in my paragraph 21, actually referred to a, um, a conflict of interest that the solicitor had permitting uh, the beneficiary to actually remain in the room at the time. Page 13, cross-checking second-hand instructions. Uh, I've spoken about this before and it, it came from the Dyke case where one of the beneficiaries changed the instructions to the solicitor, so you had the intermediary problem, uh, to include her husband in the residuary gift. She was still only going to get a third and she was going to share that with her husband essentially and she said that it was Betty Dyke's instructions. Um, trouble was, what happened is that the solicitor secretary amended the will to reflect that. Now the solicitor, this is done the penultimate will and this is the little bit that was excised because of undue influence. That solicitor was no dope. He did a good job. What he did is he had the amended will, but he said, look, you know, we've amended it. Um, is this right? Is this what you wanted? We got, we got the instructions from someone else and they knew who it was. And she said, yeah, yeah, I knew about that and that's what I want. But Justice Vickery said, well, I'm not satisfied that's really what she wanted and serving up the document to her would mean that she would have had to have rocked the boat to do anything else so she was forced into signing it. You see the point? If you get instructions from an intermediary, do not incorporate them in a document. Get your, confirm all its instructions directly. Page 14, a note about tests. This poor solicitor in Dickman and Holly he went on oath, as one would in a testamentary capacity proceeding, saying that I'm familiar with the Banks and Goodfellow test for testamentary capacity. Well, hooray. During cross-examination, it became clear that at the time he swore his affidavit, he was in fact familiar with the Banks and Goodfellow test. The only difficulty was that at the time he actually did the will, he was not. He was applying his own test, which he had developed through many years of careful experience which asked such questions as you know, who the Queen is and you know, who won the footy and, and matters of recall which don't go anywhere near the matters of judgment which have to be tested. But you can see the collapsing credibility of the man in the witness box, can't you? He swears an affidavit saying he's familiar with the test, but he just doesn't say, but not at the relevant time. You, you see the point? The time to learn the test is before you need to apply it with a particular client. So if people need to brush up on it, brush up on it. Um, that was a, a catastrophic development in that case. Interview technique on page 15. Obviously one will address the, each element of the test for capacity and uh, I've seen in my practice so many times when solicitors are absolutely convinced that the person knew what they were doing and had capacity but there is no empirical evidence that that was so. It's a judgment that the solicitor has made at the time, face to face, but what one needs is more than the assertion, one needs the empirical evidence upon which that assertion is based. And the empirical evidence, the best evidence you can get is by the testator's own words. So what you do, you don't say, 
this is your will and you want to leave this to your son or daughter or neighbour or real estate agent or whatever, don't you? And they say yes. You say, what are we doing here today? What, what, how do you want me to help you? Well, I want you to make me a will. Uh, what does a will do? Well, it leaves my property when I die. And you write all that down. Who do you want to be in it? Well, I want you know, my son because he looks after me. Um, my daughter, I don't see her so much and she's very well off, so I, I'll, I'll leave her a bit less. You write all that down. That gives the judge the empirical material from which the judge can be satisfied that your judgment was correct. If you don't do that, if uh, you just say, well, I, I told, them, told them what was in the will and they agreed with it, the judge doesn't have that confidence. That's very important. And obviously that is the way to overcome uh, the Noddy syndrome that Eleanor talked about before. Uh, on page 17, a particularly painful example of this problem is in the estate of Megok. I won't talk about Dyke because you've heard about that. But uh, just have a look at the lower half of the extract on page 17. Finally, it should be noted that Mr Levy, instead of asking the deceased what he wanted to write into the new will or asking the kinds of questions which would have demonstrated one way or the other whether the deceased was aware of the natural objects of his bounty or of his assets available for distribution, simply read the will in English to the deceased. He then relied on a friend's reading of the will in another language which he believed was Polish. He noted in his affidavit, I had the impression that he understood the will, as he was saying from time to time, words to the effect, yes, yes, yes. Well, no, no, no. That is not the way it's done. And we all know why, because we know about the Noddy syndrome. That also emphasises the need for professional interpreters, by the way. I think um, the interpreter there was a friend and was interested in the beneficiaries in some way. Watch out for apparent irrationalities that you know of. Now, I appreciate you can't know everything, and that gets to another issue. You, uh, you know, if people can corroborate information about family constellation, etc., that's a good thing. But if you know something that appears irrational on its face, watch out. That should set alarm bells ringing. The best argument for a will's validity is that it makes sense in all the circumstances. In Seely and Back, this is an interesting case because this wasn't dealing with an elderly person. This was a relatively young man. I think he was in his 40s, but he had alcoholic-induced dementia, I think. He was very, very sick, and he, he had damaged his brain considerably through alcohol abuse. <coughs> Made a will within 24 hours of discharge from hospital. He had a 12-year-old son. The solicitor knew that he had a 12-year-old son. The willmaker walked into his office and said, I want to leave my estate, which wasn't a small, to my mate at the real estate agents. And the solicitor said, aha, warning bells, problem. Well, you've got a 12-year-old son, haven't you? You have contact with him? Yes, yes. Oh, well, the way to solve the problem then is to make sure you include him as a small beneficiary. He spotted the problem. Well, he spotted the red flashing light, but misconstrued the problem. He should have thought to himself, this is not rational. He shouldn't be making this. Well, maybe he was um, led astray by the fact that the man was young. So let's not make that mistake. And the judge was uh, quite critical that he knew of that situation, clearly didn't make sense. He went ahead and made the will anyway, including the beneficiary, the son as a minor beneficiary. That wasn't the way to solve that particular problem. Look out for situations of interpersonal conflict. In Dickman and Holly, you had a couple of neighbours who thought they were the white knights rescuing this old lady from the exploitations of a, a much younger man. But they really didn't know the half of it. The much younger man had been like a son to this woman for decades. Um, read the case, and it, it's actually worth reading. It's a very good case, because the protectors actually became the problem in that case. And the protectors were so zealous in their protection that they actually physically confronted this young man. And uh, they did that in front of the testatrix. Now, she was old. And she was a little bit unstable. And the judge basically made a really interesting finding on page 20. 
He reckons that left to her own devices, in a situation of calm, she would have had testamentary capacity. She would have been able to appreciate it who had a claim on her estate and um, weighed and judged those claims. But when she was subjected to such pressure, I do not think she was capable of evaluating the strength of the claims of Mr Dickman, the Salvation Army or the previous principal beneficiary. So pressure, conflict, can perhaps negate a capacity which would otherwise be present. Capacity is situation specific. Look for situations of interpersonal conflict. In the tug of war that was going on, she wasn't up to it, though had all been um, calm, um, she probably would have been. That's well worth remembering. Probed for reasons, clearly that's um, extremely important. Um, Justice Vickery uh, didn't like the fact that the last will in a $15 million estate, uh, I think the specific bequests went down or were changed by about $140,000. He said no reasons were asked for or given. That um, leaves me with no confidence that um, she knew what she was doing. On the other hand, the solicitor who did the penultimate will did ask for reasons and he wrote down the reasons straight from the testatrix's mouth. That is so important. So um, he was much more satisfied about that. Brown and Gus at paragraph 36, the solicitor that did the penultimate will um, didn't ask the will maker why she hadn't actually included the effect of the 2005 agreement in the 2007 will. Um, his explanation for this was that he considered it unnecessary to ask her about it. He did not think that the fact that he had never dealt with the deceased before was all the more reason to ask her for an explanation. Now we don't want things like that being written about us. Doctors, GPs are the ones that um, you would uh, primarily rely upon, but you involve them at a sufficiently early stage. Now look, I'm not silly, I was a solicitor for nine years, I know this is difficult, they're terribly busy, they're not particularly helpful, I know that. But just a couple of things to try and get, and get the best out of them. They're important because they see the deceased, whereas a, um, someone doing a psychological autopsy, to coin a phrase, will later on all the papers will never have seen the deceased. But they're also important because they can corroborate information about her history, his history, his family, all these sorts of things. I don't know if you remember the case of Flynn and Rocasano. These people turned up off the street and uh, made wills and said they didn't have any family. And seemed absolutely fine. Trouble was, they had a daughter. And the solicitor just didn't know. Now, I'm not being critical of that solicitor because they presented so well that um, he had no reason to do anything but accept their instructions at face value. But it just goes to show that what you get from someone across the table is not always the truth. And if you have a source of corroboration with appropriate consents, use it where you need to. GPs can be good for that. When you are checking capacity with them, write a good letter to them setting out the elements of the test, because I can promise you this, half of them don't know it. It's in the AMA handbook. I've seen it, but they don't know it because they don't read it. They do mini mental tests and say, well, they got 27 out of 30 on a mini mental, passed with flying colours. And we all know that the mini mental test is actually not designed to test capacity because it doesn't test judgment. It is completely immune to judgment. So dealing with GPs, obviously first get the consent. You can do it in the same way as before. Look, you know, we've just got to make sure that, um, you know, that all sorts of funny things are happening in the courts at the minute. We have to make sure that everything is above board and seen to be above board. And so I'd like to speak to your doctor. Direct the doctor to the elements of the test because they won't know it. And when you've got the will, get the doctor to sit down, even in your presence, even with you, if you can manage that with the, you know, with the doctor. I know people are smiling. It's, it, that won't be easy to arrange, but if you can, that's best. And go through the particular will with the doctor. The particular will. In Dyke, the doctor didn't know what was in the will, but he gave a certificate saying that he was um, confident that Betty was able to make the will. But he didn't know what was in it. 
Now, it didn't matter. We, uh, Justice Vickery upheld that will on other evidence, but you see the point. If the will is in front of them, then what more can you do? What more can you have? And again, they can be good sources of corroboration. If you're still in doubt, bear this in mind. Your duty is to give proper consideration to any matter affecting validity. Um, if you're in doubt, satisfy your doubts to the extent that you possibly can and document the process. If you're still in doubt after that, it seems, on the authority of Ryan Public Trustee, though I don't think this is binding, but you can understand why it would be good to do this, you should still make the will, but you have a complete and accurate record of your thorough dealing with the transaction so that in due course the judge can decide because you are giving the judge the material to decide whether or not the will was valid. I mean, clearly, if you believe someone does not have capacity, you do not make the will. But if, if you entertain a doubt, if the process has been taken as far as you can take it and it's properly documented, then it seems um, to me that uh, Justice Elias is uh, correct to say that the will ought to be made and the material upon which a judge can ultimately assess its validity be retained. I've probably gone on a bit too much. I will just say there are two schedules. I won't, won't go through them, but these are extracts from the judgments in Brown and Gus and Veal and Veal. And you can just see some of the comments that were made about the various processes there. Obviously, um, Brown and Gus deals with Anna McKenna, so that's all good. Veal and Veal deals with the unnamed solicitor, and that's not so good. Have a look at them uh, in, your own, uh, in your own time. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. That's a very interesting paper. I know a lot of you have got uh, busy practices to get back to. We do have some brief time for questions. I'm sure that if there are further questions, both Andrew and Eleanor will be happy to receive them by email and even happier by brief. <laughs> I, I just make this observation, just looking at page one of Andrew's paper, that one in 20 persons over the age of 65 will have some form of dementia. I turn 60 next March. <laughs> I played golf on the weekend with some friends and I know my wife told me three times what we were doing for dinner that night, but do you <laughs> think I could tell them? So I'd like to thank both Andrew and Eleanor for their very informative papers. I'd suggest for all solicitors who prepare wills, you've probably also got junior staff, um, junior solicitors, maybe even probate clerks. It'd be a great idea to give them a copy of the British Columbia checklist and perhaps even just, well certainly the papers, but certainly the headings on Andrew's paper so that you've got this checklist that can be there if needed. Thank you for your attendance. Thank you.